So to start this thing off, I just want to clearly state, I don't want any sympathy or anything like that. I just want to share some of my experience. And all I ask in this video is just please don't leave a comment until you finish the entire video. All right, I hope to just share some of my personal experience because I know a lot of you just don't know me or what I've been through or why I talk about the things that I talk about. And addiction is something that hits very close to home for me. So the first person I lost to addiction was my ex-girlfriend. She was one of the first loves of my life and she passed away when she was 24 years old from her addiction and I was in active addiction at that time too and I had a lot of survivor's guilt over it. I asked myself a million times like I should have done this, like what could I have done differently? How could I have helped her? What could I have done to save her? How could I have helped her? Right? And it's something that still pops up in my mind to this day almost 10 years later. All right? And since I was in active addiction, I knew that what she was going through was so painful and difficult to overcome. And a few years later is when I finally got clean and sober. And when I, <laughs> like, believe it or not, as thick headed as you think I am, I used to be a lot worse. Um, when I first got sober, it was letting go of old beliefs and the biggest belief was that I knew everything, right? I hated people telling me what to do. I didn't want to get a sponsor. I didn't like any kind of authority figures my entire life. And I kept wondering like, why are people, why do people care? Why are they all up in my business? You know what I mean? And I would get pissed and I did, I did everything. I did everything that they told me not to do. Every single thing they told me not to do, I did. Aside from get drunk or high. They told me not to date, and I, I've mentioned this before, so let me clarify that. Like, I didn't date, but I went on two dates with the same girl, and I made a video about it a while back, but it was a terrible idea. I was in no place emotionally, mentally, to even try to get in a relationship. And everybody kept saying, don't get into relationships, and I saw so many of my friends do it and not take the advice or take the suggestions and so many of them relapsed and some of them started to die and I started to witness more people die in the rooms of 12 step meetings and the saddest part about it was you would see it coming from a mile away you would see people who would not be taking the suggestions right or you'd see them stop coming to meetings or you'd see them you know, just putting themselves in situations that might, you know, hurt their recovery and put them in a risky situation. So I eventually moved back to Las Vegas. And one of the things that, you know, really affected me was my best friend, my best friend growing up, like his family is like my family. He was one of the first guys I met here in Las Vegas. Well, we became addicted together to alcohol and drugs. And I got sober. And while many of my friends and everybody abandoned me, like he was still there, but it was partially because he was still in active addiction. But like when I first moved back to Las Vegas, I had to sleep on his couch because nobody else would let me stay there even though I had over a year clean. And I had to watch my friend like going down the same spiral that I was. He was starting to lose everything and he was slowly killing himself. And I eventually moved out and everything like that. And he used to get really pissed off at me, you know, when he would get drunk and call me and yell at me and say, oh, you think you're better than me now? And all these other things. And it's just like, nah, man, like, I'm not, I'm not better than you. I'm just in a different place and I care and I'm trying to help. And because of his addiction, he used to call me all the time, at least once or twice a week, he would call me and he would tell me how depressed he was and he would tell me that he wanted to kill himself like my best friend in the world who is like a brother to me, he was telling me multiple times a week that he wanted to kill himself. He would call me driving drunk from a bar and saying that he wanted to just drive his car off the road and end it all, right? And the one thing that he would always say to me is, please don't tell my parents. Please don't tell my parents. And 
I wouldn't. I wouldn't tell his parents. And one day, like I was sitting there because this was months of him doing this and talking about being suicidal. And I, I was sitting there and I was just thinking like, when is this gonna happen? When is he gonna finally do it? When is he gonna finally kill himself? And how am I gonna feel about that? And I sat there and I asked myself, I'm like, okay, like if he does end up killing himself, do I wanna live with the guilt of knowing that I didn't do anything or I didn't say anything or I didn't try to tell his parents? And I sat there and I debated it for a while and I was like, should I tell his parents? And I knew if I did that, it might ruin our friendship forever. I knew that he might hate me for the rest of his life, but I knew that I didn't want his death on my conscience just because I didn't say something. So I ended up calling his mom and told her what was going on, how bad his addiction was, how he was suicidal and he needed help. And she was crying and it broke my heart to hear her cry because she's like a mom to me. And he was pissed. He got really fucking pissed at me. And he didn't want anything to do with me. And they ended up having an intervention for him. His family did. And he called me up and he said, Chris, can you drive me out to rehab in California tomorrow morning? And I said, yeah, I'll do it. And he showed up the next day at 4 a.m. And we drove down to Southern California and checked him into rehab. This was coming up on four years ago and he's still clean and sober to this day. And that's all because I had to make the decision to do something that would really fucking piss him off at me. And not long after, actually while he was, while he was in rehab, is when I got a job at a rehab. My life had no direction for a really long time. Didn't know what I wanted to do, didn't know what the purpose of life was, and I kind of fell into this job at a rehab center. And they knew, and most of you know too, I'm not a therapist, I'm not a psychologist or anything like that, but I'm somebody who is tired of seeing people die. And it's made me so passionate about what I do when I talk about addiction and mental illness and all these other things. Working at that treatment center was the best thing that's ever happened to me and it was also the hardest thing to ever happen to me. I worked there for a little over three years. I helped a lot of people. I worked with thousands of clients. But during that time, I lost over 70 people. And that just sounds like a number to everybody, but like I want you to think about that just for a second. How many lives that is, how many people that I met, people who sat in my office and talked to me, people who had relapsed and come back to treatment and I tried to help them. You know, 70 people. There were so many of those people who I talked to the day before they died. I have seen so much death. I've done so many memorial services. Like, it's something that I, I don't expect anybody to understand, and I hope nobody else has to go through that. You know what I mean? Like, never in a million years did I think that 70 people that I interacted with would be dead. And a lot of them were overdoses, some of them were suicides because, and I've, I've shared this in a video, like when we get clean, when we get sober, like we can become really suicidal. And one of the issues is, is that whenever somebody would die, everybody would ask the same questions that I asked after my ex-girlfriend died, like what could I have done differently? Were there signs that I should have looked for? You know, and part of what I do with my channel is I try to educate people because a lot of people don't know what to look for. They don't, they don't see it. And I'm tired, man. I'm tired because every person who dies or even relapses, like for the 70 people who died, like I've seen hundreds of more relapses. And when it happens, everybody is so confused. Everybody's so confused and it's because we don't talk about mental health. We don't talk about addiction. We say, don't talk about that stuff. You know what I mean? And we don't talk about it and it happens right in front 
of our faces. So part of my job was to educate people and I would call family members and ask them and follow up and how are these people doing? And they had my personal, uh, well not personal, it was a work cell phone. They had that number they could call me and if they were worried about anything and say, hey, he's, he's doing this since he got back home. Like, is this normal? Is this okay? Like they're hanging out at bars. They're hanging out with their old using buddies. Should they be doing this, right? Like these are questions and it might seem silly to some of you out there, but these are legitimate questions that the loved ones have. Like I've spoken to mothers and fathers and sisters and brothers and husbands and wives and children of addicts and alcoholics who ask me questions because they don't know what to look for, all right? And when those people do relapse or God forbid, those people pass away, I, I would talk to those loved ones and talk them through the grieving process that I've been through so many times. Now, while also at that treatment center, part of my job was to help people get back into treatment after they relapsed. And <laughs> I've worked with literally thousands of people and I'm telling you, man, like, the, like relapse rates are so high and it blows my mind because I could see it as clear as day. People who left treatment and did what was suggested of them they went on to live these incredible lives. They would not only stay clean, but live, live these incredible lives. But other people who didn't do what was suggested, they would relapse and or die. And I'm just like, fuck man, like, why can't, why can't we just believe what people are telling us? Why can't we just take these suggestions, you know? If it wasn't for me taking suggestions when I first got sober, I probably would have relapsed. I probably would be dead too, right? But why I started this YouTube channel, and I was just itching my eye. That wasn't a fake tear or anything. But why I started this YouTube channel is I remember being in group and people were so ungrateful, right? Like there was a lot of people who were like, thanks, thank God to this rehab, it saved my life. But there was a lot of people who were ungrateful, not paying attention and all that stuff. And I'm like, you know what? Screw this. I'm like, listen. I'm like, do you know how many people outside of this treatment center would kill to be in your seat, right? And I worked at an expensive treatment center. I'm like, screw it, why don't I just hop on YouTube and start making videos? Like what I teach in groups and what I teach in one-on-one -on -one sessions, why don't I try doing that on YouTube for all the people who don't have access to this stuff? And obviously what I found out was, hey, you know, based on the YouTube algorithm, you talk about trending topics and things like that and boom, now people see your videos. Now, again, like, don't get me wrong, like, I, I know a lot of you don't know me and, you know, and things like that, but um, the idea that we only do this for money, like, that's nothing new to me. I remember working in the treatment center, clients, when they get really fucking pissed off, like, you don't care about me, you're just working here for the money, and I was making pennies there, right? I'm making even less now, <laughs> but anyways, like, I get it, like, Nobody's gonna know somebody else's true motives, true intentions, but I had people who were pissed, didn't like what I had to say, and you know, say that me or their therapist or their psychologist or their doctor was only in it for the money. But anyways, now that I'm here on YouTube, I see it happening all over again in this community, right? Like, we just lost Etika, and I think it was Philip DeFranco who said it. it it's like drowning in a room filled with people and everybody's just watching, right? And I've mentioned this in my Etika videos, like I was first introduced to him when he was having the standoff with police and like working in addiction slash mental health treatment for three years, I saw it. I saw it happening right in front of our eyes and I'm like, oh my God, like, he is not in a good place, right? I made a video when he got out of the hospital and Keemstar interviewed him right after. And I'm like, oh my God. And it was because Keemstar didn't know. He didn't know. He didn't have the experience to know that you don't interview somebody who just came out of a mental health facility, right? And he didn't know. And who's going to teach him about that, you know? 
And we, we watched it happen and the internet fueled that man. They gassed him up and there's so many things and so many people have pointed fingers and pointed blame and everything like that. I've even had to come out and freaking defend Keemstar, a guy who I don't like because of all the finger pointing. And there's a bunch of articles and videos out there about how the community at large contributed to Etika's suicide, right? And again, like, people might hear me talking about this and think I'm just being extra or something like that, but again, I have witnessed a lot of death in my life. I've seen it, I've seen the patterns that lead to suicide, that lead to overdose, that lead to relapse. I've seen it far too many times. So now we're what, 16 minutes in. Let's talk about Taylor Nicole Dean. I was first introduced to Taylor Nicole Dean way back in the day, way back in the day before a lot of people hated me. I would get a lot of requests and everything like that and people, huh, I had so many DMs like, you need to talk about Taylor Nicole Dean and her animal hoarding. You need to talk about Taylor Nicole Dean and her pets that are dying and I'm like, I don't know shit about taking care of animals. I have one cat. Well, now we have two cats in this house. I'm like, I don't know anything about that. Like, I got introduced to this whole genre on YouTube about animals. And there's a lot of people like, hey, meet my pets. Here's me feeding my pets. And Taylor and Nicole Dean was like, the shit at that, right? And like, so I started to do a little research, but I didn't do anything with it. And I think the first time I actually talked about it might have been when she first opened up about her addiction, right? And I, I talked about it because her boyfriend at that time, Johnny Craig, he was addicted too, and I just shared my experience about people introducing other people to drugs and like and things like that, right? So that's when the community came over to my channel and they they taught me a little something. They said, hey, Chris, not only does she hoard animals, not only does she, has she had animals die, but her boyfriend, Johnny Craig, has been accused of rape, right? And I'm like, shit. And I didn't know that, and I'm like, okay. Like, then people were telling me that Taylor Nicole Dean defended him and called the other women liars. And I'm like, oh, shit. Like, that's crazy. And I didn't want to touch that with a 10-foot pole. So anyways, Taylor Nicole Dean ended up going to rehab and I made a video. I made a video saying how proud I was of her and how hard it is to get clean, get sober and how taking that step to go to treatment is such a big, big deal. And she came back from treatment and that's when I made a video. And after like a couple weeks of her kind of being inactive, like even on my video, I had a lot of people saying that she looked high and everything like that. And I, I never like accusing people of being high unless there's like some really good evidence, right? Like I mentioned this in one of the recent videos, like when we first get clean, we have a lot of ups and downs and everything. It's just part of the process. But then time went by and people said, do you know any, like what's going on with Taylor Nicole Dean? She kind of disappeared again and everything. I'm like, huh. And I'm like, I hope she's doing all right, you know, um, because in my experience, you know, my last seven years being clean, like when people are early in recovery and they kind of disappear, like it's not a good sign. And then, you know, um, I can't remember if somebody DM me or I just caught it, like she just got out of treatment. I'm like, oh shit, she went back and I made a video. I made another video just the other day talking about how proud I was of her for not giving up, going back in there breaking up with her boyfriend, Johnny Craig, and all of those things. And this is where all the shit started because she started seeing a dude that she met in rehab. Now, I've been clean for seven years. I'm not gonna go back over all this. I've explained it thoroughly in my videos, but I've been clean for seven years. I've worked in a rehab. I've seen rehab relationships and romances and all that stuff, right? And here's, here's my concern. When I saw this happening and I saw people defending and I saw some people calling her out 
there's one story that stuck in my head that just popped out because again I've worked with many many clients in different stories like whenever I see something like I remember different situations of what happened and long story short there was a a guy in rehab and uh, he didn't want to be there his family forced him to be there he hated being there he slept through 90% of the groups or he ditched the groups if he did attend groups and he was awake he would cause disturbances he would bug the other clients he would interrupt just all sorts of things right and I'm like fuck man you know um, I was worried about him and he left and part of my job was to follow up with clients after they left and I ended up calling him up to see how he was doing and I talked to his mom. And his, his mom picks up the phone, I'm like, hey, it's Chris, I'm the alumni coordinator, you know, just want to see how, you know, your son's doing. And she's like, oh yeah, you know, I don't know how he's doing, he's been staying home a lot and staying in bed and everything like that. I'm like, okay. And she's like, yeah, but I, I've been going to a lot of al meetings. I'm like, fucking cool, right? Like. I, I wish, I wish everybody's families would go to Al-Anon meetings. What I try to teach people is like, you can't expect that. They're not always going to, but when I hear a family member going to Al-Anon, I'm like, that is fucking awesome. If you don't know what Al-Anon is, it's for loved ones to learn how to deal with drug addicts and alcoholics, right? So I was like, that's cool, like right on. And I was just like, so what about him? Has he been going to meetings since he left? Because the rehab I worked at, it was 12-step based. We always suggested people go to 90 meetings in 90 days and get a sponsor and all those other things. She's like, no, he said he didn't have to go to meetings. I'm like, come again? And she's like, yeah, he, he said, you know, after doing groups and uh, talking to his therapist and psychologist, they told him that he was fine and he doesn't need to go to meetings or anything like that because he, he was taught that we're the problem and we need to go to meetings and understand his addiction and we need to learn how to be more accepting of him and everything like that and like a record scratch goes off of my fucking head I'm like wait what I'm like so he came home and he told you that we said nothing was wrong with him it's all your fault I'm like no 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 that's that's not that's not what we teach people you know um, and I had to educate her about that and stuff. And I'm not sure what ended up happening. This was a year or two ago. But again, when I saw this Taylor Nicole thing, uh, Taylor Nicole Dean thing going down, it reminded me of that story. And I have to sit here and think, right? Like Taylor Nicole Dean's recovery is none of my fucking business. And some of you have said that. It is absolutely none of my fucking business. But a concern I have is motivating people to do things that are very risky, right? Like, I imagine the person who's watching that and they get inspired to go to rehab but then they also get inspired to start dating somebody in rehab or hooking up with somebody in rehab, which could end up taking them back out into their active addiction. So I make my videos for those people and I'm sorry if that hurt Taylor Nicole Dean's feelings. Well, it did and I apologize for that, but we have to talk about these things because, because again, like I've been doing this for seven years. I've met thousands of addicts. I've seen so many horror stories. I've seen stories of relapse. I don't have enough time in a day to talk about how many rehab relationships I've seen just go absolutely sideways. I'm talking about violence. I'm talking about like attempted murder I made a video about this like a month or two ago like I just hope that some of you understand where I'm coming from and again it is not like I don't make these videos to purposely piss people off or anything like that but when somebody with influence is influencing other people I don't want to sit back idly and just watch and I don't know like I have no delusion that Taylor Nicole Dean changed her mind about this whole thing because of my fucking videos I don't but maybe 
maybe she's like, okay, maybe this isn't a good idea. I don't know, right? And like, I hope she stays clean. I hope she stays sober. Like one of my best friends, he's been sober seven years too. Early in recovery, he got in a relationship. They dated for a while. It ended in heartache. He came this close to relapse, but he made it through. You know, and like I said, I did everything wrong my first year. Every fucking thing wrong. The only thing I did right was I didn't get drunk or high. You know what I mean? But I look at myself as one of the lucky ones. I've seen so many people relapse for far, far less than the dumb shit I've done. You know? So I try to speak up and share my experience about what I've witnessed with all the people that I've talked to and met and you know, and all those other things. But anyways, this is a long ass video. And if you made it this far, thank you. Like this whole thing, like, I don't know. Um, I'm not like taking a break or anything, but like, this is like, I, I just, I'm, I'm going to do my best not to make a YouTube video. Like just to stay the fuck off of YouTube for a couple days. Like, cause I pissed a lot of people off and I hope this video helped some people understand. You know, like I get it. I get why Taylor Nicole Dean is pissed off. I get why other people are pissed off and everything like that. But again, a lot of people just don't have experience with addiction, with recovery, with people in their lives and everything like that. And I just hope to educate people. So if they see somebody who gets back home from rehab, they know what signs to look for. Or if they know somebody who can't afford rehab and goes to 12 step meetings, they, they know what things to look for. You know what I mean? But yeah, um, I'm gonna stay off YouTube for a, uh, a couple days, probably this weekend. Um, I'll probably still be posting on Instagram and stuff. I'm gonna try to stay off Twitter too. I can be a jackass on Twitter. Um, but anyways, again, thanks. If you watch this whole thing, thanks. And, uh, yeah, feel free to leave comments down below because we made a deal at the beginning. Don't leave a comment until you watch the whole video. And that's what you just did. All right. Uh, love you guys. Stay well. And, uh, I don't know if you guys ever have any questions like for me, like feel free to just like contact me. I, I, okay. All right, Chris, you need to shut the fuck up. But anyways, I've actually talked to a lot of people in DMS the last few days and just like having these conversations, like I love, I like having one-on-one -on -one conversations. I like to get to know people and them get to know me. You know what I mean? Like, so if you have any questions or whatever, like feel free to reach out. I'm always willing to talk. All right. But anyways, I'll shut the fuck up now. I'll see you guys later.